Atxaldeon guztioi, Donostia Internazion. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Donostia International Physics Center, uh, welcome to the International Conference on Passion for Knowledge. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to Passion for Knowledge, a festival with the aim of promoting science as a key activity to contribute to the welfare of future generations and to celebrate a knowledge uh, to foster uh, uh, the future culture of our culture. I uh, go back to the words of uh, Pedro Echenique, a president of uh, the Donosti International Physics Center, when he says that uh, science is the most important collective uh, work of uh, humankind. That's why Passion for Knowledge uh, is where we have uh, worldwide uh, representatives of science and humanities, amongst them different uh, Nobel laureates. But um, uh, mainly, it brings together citizenship to share scientific knowledge and promote uh, uh, the participation of the audience in uh, science. Have you seen in the video? The program includes uh, different uh, plenary lectures like the two we have today in Bilbao. We also have uh, meetings uh, with uh, scientists and uh, students, uh, different shows, and so on and so forth. This is the fifth edition of this festival that started in 2010 to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Donosti International Physics Center. Most of the activities of Passion for Knowledge are held in San Sebastian, even though one of the challenges is to broaden its impact beyond the main headquarters. That's why Passion for Knowledge is also brought here to Bilbao. This morning, there has been a meeting of uh, students of the Basque Country with uh, several of the speakers in passion for knowledge like Donna Stickland and George Smooth. And uh, um, the DIPC was created as an intellectual adventure. All adventure is based on passion. In this case, uh, knowledge, uh, discovering, and therefore that's why we gave this name to the Festival of Passion for Knowledge, always with the aim of excellence in all of its activities. Excellence, uh, that is the highest performance, but also rigor, responsibility, and integrity. The DIPC is also an institutional adventure, an example of public-private partnership thanks to the commitment of different institutions that provide their support with determination and continuity. Troi publiko ei, uri eskerrak beroenak, eusko jaurlaritzari, Euskal Herriko Unibertsitateari, Gipuzkoako Foru Aldundiari eta Donostiako Udalari. Gracias también a los patronos privados, Kucha, CAF, Telefónica y EDP Naturgas. Especialmente, hoy queremos dar las gracias a Telefónica por haber facilitado que este acto tenga lugar en un escenario tan privilegiado de la ciudad de Bilbao como es este Palacio de Euskalduna. Y sin más preámbulos, damos ya la bienvenida a la primera ponente de Passion for Knowledge en Bilbao. Francesca, la profesora Francesca Ferlaino. Fran Francesca Francesca Ferlaino is born in Naples and she's an expert in quantum physics. And she uh, works in uh, um, ultra low 
temperatures. Her group at the Innsbruck uh, University has uh, recently discovered a new state for uh, matter, super solid, with both uh, solid and uh, liquid uh, properties. So the particles inside a flow like a liquid because they are delocated in a quantum manner. Uh, she studied uh, physics uh, in uh, Naples. Uh, she di did her PhD in Florence. And in the year 2007, she moved to Innsbruck in Austria. And since 2014, she's a professor and scientific director of the Quantum Optics Institute in the Innsbruck University. In the last year, she's received different awards of prestige, amongst them the Erwin uh, Schrodinger Prize, the Feltrinelli Prize, the Alexander von Humboldt Chair, the Science Prize of the City of Innsbruck, the Ignaz L. Lieben Prize, and the Fritz Kohlschrauss Prize for Experimental Physics. She has also received a START Award and the three ERC grants in starting consolidator and uh, advanced grants. Francesca will be uh, speaking about uh, atoms approaching absolute zero temperature, the hardware of future quantum technologies. I can assure you she's a great scientist and communicator, as you will see now. Fortunately, she comes a lot to the Basque Country as part of the uh, program of the DIPC, and we hope that one day she can uh, work between Innsbruck and uh, the DIPC. The uh, uh, most uh, difficult part uh, has been achieved because uh, his uh, um, husband is from San Sebastian. So uh, now, uh, Professor Ferlaino, the floor is yours. Gracias y es I talk in English, I hope it's fine, there is the translator. So it's a great honor to be here, it's a great no honor to be part of this fantastic festival celebrating science and celebrating really the passion for knowledge. And, uh, and I really think that this is a, a very deep uh, feeling uh, to have this passion. And when I've been invited, uh, I, I had to, cho to choose uh, what I will speak about. Uh, and so I thought that maybe the best uh, to you know, come together in this festival was uh, you know, showing uh, what is the, the way that several quantum physicists uh, have taken over the year, what is the feeling uh, of uh, a new discovery, what is the feeling of thinking about things uh, which are very far away from your, our normal life. So I will just briefly mention at the end uh, so the research of my group because I would like actually to bring you on a journey with me. The journey that it's called, uh, a word called quantum, and to try to explain uh, what is going on uh, now. And uh, to do this, uh, I think that uh, I would like to you know, start with, uh, with a quotation, really celebrating this passion of knowledge. Uh, this is from uh, Erwin Schrödinger, that was one of the founding fathers of quantum mechanics. And so what he's saying, and I think we should really take a few seconds to think about, uh, is that the task of scientists is not to see what has never been seen before. Actually, the task is to think what have never been thought before. About what? About what is around us every day. So to think different. That's kind of the feeling, the message. What we see every day, but we think differently about this. And this is the power of science. That's the power of fundamental physics that I would like to uh, share with you. And indeed, I mean, uh, somehow our <laughs> Everyday life, it's very beautiful. No? And, uh, and actually, this everyday life uh, that we have, our understanding of what is surrounding us, uh, it's made of very small uh, you know, component, which can be atom, molecule, or a little particle of light that we like to call photon. So those are the key ingredients, or as we like sometimes to say, building block of the reality. But then one could say, OK, those are the building blocks. That means that our reality and that this building block follow the same rules, 
but actually it's not like this. While the reality around us is actually following classical physics, all this very tiny element is following other law, which are the law of quantum mechanics. The word quantum mechanics was introduced about 100 years ago by, uh, let's say, a group of uh, physicists uh, in the, at the University of Göttingen. It's actually around the 1920s, and was meant to define the physics, uh, the law governing small things, like atom, molecule, photon. But actually now, from... Uh, 100 years ago to today, there have been a lot of discovery. So we start to understand what are these quantum mechanics, what is the implication. And actually, we now like to, uh, to use a, a special sentence to show that now our understanding is getting a very high maturity, and we speak very recently about what is called the second quantum revolution. And what I would like to tell you is why after about 100 years, we are again in a quantum res resolution. What does it change? The first re uh, revolution that was really the establishment of quantum mechanics was about understanding new law of nature. Now is about mastering, engineering, controlling, uh, and make use of this new law. Okay, so a few years ago, uh, prominent scientists, you know, wrote all together a white paper showing indeed the opportunity of quantum mechanics and quantum physics. And just uh, after, a few years after, the European Union decided that uh, to call quantum f technology as a disruptive new technology and consider to be a flagship of the, let's say, this new disrupting technology development. And since then, as a, as a physicist, we are in the lab, we do fundamental science. I do fundamental science and not quantum technology, but I saw really a big change in my community because it started to become extremely interesting. And also, suddenly, there have been a seeding of you know, money as support to the quantum technology. Over the last few years, I think we are now about 22 billion around the world. And also, I mean, there is a lot which go behind us uh, about, let's say, geopolitical, uh, uh, let's say, uh, allocation of support for this new quantum technology. Here you see an example of the number of uh, patent filling in China, comparison to US, and all this in the last, uh, you know, it's getting exponential increase uh, over the last few years. There are many of these graphs you can find in the internet, but what is my job is to try to give you the sense of why, or what is so powerful about quantum mechanics, and what is quantum, actually. And that's what we want to do, and to do this, let's do a step back. So, and to go really back, back, back in time, so wh when uh, actually the first concept of communicating, uh, sending message over long distance was really introduced? Well, one key, uh, you know, <laughs> development happened already in the 19th and 20th century. And actually, the first very important, uh, let's say, result was the discovery of uh, electric and magnetic field and the description of this as wave. Now, the wave, uh, the electric wave or the magnetic wave, can be sent through very long distance. And actually, in the height and the power to simplify of this wave, you might maybe even be able to encode signal. Okay, so uh, light is transporting electric and magnetic field and can encode signal. This idea was then picked up by several scientists, and here I quote Guillermo Marconi, that actually created the first long-distance radio transmission, which is the telegraph. Now, soon after, uh, with a lot of effort, uh, so together with the team and other scientists, this was the first transatlantic transmission. And then, uh, recently after, he also got the Nobel Prize together with Carl Ferdinand Brown for the development of wireless telegraphy. Okay, many years ago. And actually, the idea here was to send messages using wave, 
So just let's remember the send message using wave, and the language of this message was what we all know, which is the Morse code. So let's say the, lo the, the point was to try to have two symbols, one is long, let's say this is long, and one is short, and to convert every letter of the alphabet and number in a sequence of this long, short, long, short, long, long, short, short. But this is already, this idea was then picked up by the binary logic that we use in our computer, because every of our computer is nothing else of a string, and that's the classical logic, of something which is 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1. So you see, there are two values, long, short, high, low, off, on, 0, 1. That's the binary logic. It's the classical logic that's the one used in mobile phone, in your computer, in every type of calculator that you can have in several ways. Of course, the logic is very powerful. You encode the complex information into a sequence of string of 0, 1. But then, that's not enough. You have the logic, which means for me you have a language, we agree on the language, we do binary language, but we need to have something that is speaking this language. Well, in classical physics, uh, this something which has two logic levels is the transistor. And uh, actually, the first, uh, what it's called maybe to be one of the first computers, is this Turing machine. Maybe some of you saw the movie. And actually, it was used that to crack uh, the crypto system Enigma that was used by the Germ German Reich during the Second World War. This was a gigantic, that's basically a first computer, which is basically a big calculator, which was with the aim of the, 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 so to you know, break, crack uh, the crypto system enigma. And all this was speaking and make calculation based on 0101. And the object uh, was not yet a transistor at the time. At the time, it was, was something very big called a vacuum tube. Then, I mean, there was develop development, and the hardware was developed a lot, and really the transistors were invented. This is much smaller, you see, and this can very efficiently encode this logic 0101. Now, there was a, an additional strong development in technology, which was with the integrated circuit. And now you will have this small object with many transistors inside. And what is interesting is that there is a, an empirical law, which is called the Moore law, that tells you that while the years are progressing, the last year is it 2020 in this graph, the number of transistors, so this object that is able to speak 0101, is kind of doubling every two years. That's a semi-log scale. Today, in a, you know, a microchip, we have a 50, about 50 billion transistors. One second. We have, you know, more transistor, more powerful uh, computer that's easy to understand, but actually the computer is getting smaller. And what is actually the ultimate limit? How many transistors can we still put in in something that is getting smaller and smaller? And uh, that's interesting, actually, because uh, the size uh, of the initial vacuum tube in the Turing uh, um, machine was, uh, I mean, big as a penny, but now we are getting to transistor and integrated circuit, which are decreasing a lot the, their, you know, their size, going almost at the size of a bacteria, and the ultimate limit to get, you know, the size of an atom. And uh, then you can ask how much energy you need uh, to control one of these uh, electronic devices, 0101. Well, the energy is reaching another regime, which is, will be enough to have one electron per device to activate one device. OK, one moment. Now we have one atom, the size, one electron, the charge. We are again about the physics of tiny things. That's where quantum physics enters into play. And so we would say that, the, let's say, the watershed that were divided in this classical world to the quantum world is getting narrower and narrower. But let's see what is so special about the quantum world. Can it give us something more than a zero-one transistor? Well, the first concept, uh, which is maybe the most difficult in some sense, at least for me, to understand that is uh, 
how the energy of a single atom or a single electron is. Now, when we put, I'm Italian, so I used to do this example, we put uh, water and we make boiling water and we are, when it's boiling, we put pasta inside and the temperature of the water is continuously increasing. Okay, so there is a continuous increase of the temperature of your water. When the energy is quantized, this increase of energy, it's not anymore continuously, but jump from one level to the other level. If this is one electron volt and this is two electron volt, the atom cannot take any value in between the two. It's like a step function. That's the concept of quantization. And quantization also somehow protects the level the energy level of an atom, because it's not so easy to get if nothing happens from here to down. So there is this quantization which actually defines very clearly a discrete number of value that the energy can take. It's not continuous, that's a big difference. And it's a big difference also because if this is the case, I know where exactly what the energy level of my atom, I can even use laser light or photon that we said before, and by giving this laser light, I can promote my atom in an excited state. Okay, I have two levels. One is down, one is up. I have zero, one. I'm getting back to the idea that I have two very distinct states of an object, and this is just an atom having it. And so far you might think, okay, fine, you know, it's a transistor, instead of being an electric circuit, it's just an atom. Okay, you will encode a very long string of zero, one that's over, but actually there is much more, because, and here is the craziness coming up, because in a, the state of your atom can be at the same time in zero and in one. This is one of the uh, principle, key principles of quantum mechanics, which is called superposition principle. So before you make any measurement, the atom can be at the same time down and up. That's why we speak about this Schrodinger cat, which is at the same time dead and alive. It's at the same time two different things. And, uh, and these have a lot of uh, you know, power because now, let's say, the state that don't have to take only zero and one can take many more value. And actually, related to the key fundament foundation of quantum mechanics, there was the Nobel Prize of last year given to Zeilinger, Clauser and Aspe for the entanglement in, in principle. So somehow, let's say, to put it in more simple means, uh, when you have two doors, in our classical world, there are decisions that we need to take. Either we go to the right door or we go to the left door. But if we are in the quantum world, actually, you don't have to take any decision. You could pass simultaneously in both doors. And now you might think that I'm crazy, that all this is just an oddity, that's just mathematical, that it's not happening, but actually you can really do experiment. You can really send, uh, let's say, some uh, flux of light uh, in two doors, and you can really see outside on the screen that they are passing everywhere at the same time. And you can even do this with atom or, le or electron, this is the so-called double slit experiment where you see in the screen that there is a probability to pass in both. And so this is a very powerful concept, uh, but now come a diff an, an additional little difficulties. So what you need to, uh, let's say our world is deterministic. Either you go to the right door or to the left door. The quantum world doesn't need this definition. It's not important. When you start to measure, it's becoming important. Before you measure, you are in this superposition state. So now this state is in a superposition of zero and one, then you are measuring, and you get only projected in one of the states with a given probability. Or you do again the measurement, and you are projected in another state with another given probability. So in total, you can have much more value because of the probability that's simply zero and one. 
So somehow, to make it uh, an idea, while the classical bit is taking 0 and 1, the qubit uh, can take uh, all the value between 0, 1, 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.001, 0 0.2, and so on. And this is extremely efficient, see, to the point that in theory, let's say, if you think about 60 cub 64 qubit and all possible state, this would be equivalent to the number of state you have with 10 to the 20 classical bit. So this is a, an extremely important change, uh, and actually it's called in some cases uh, uh, quantum supremacy. Now the problem where we are today is to find, uh, we have found the language. The language seems very powerful, this qubit, uh, let's say this superposition principle, it seems very, very powerful. And the question is, what is the object able to speak this quantum logic? So what is the quantum transistor? And actually, this is where there is today the technological race, to find the proper object that speak quantum physics. There are several uh, companies around the world, a very big one, a lot of research group, but I think there is not yet you know, a clear identification of what would be the hardware here. Now, I told you about one atom, how powerful it is, the idea that the energy levels are quantized, that one possible application of this is really to create this qubit, but there is also much more. Let's abandon the qubit and let's see what more this quantized level can give it to us. So another thing that it can give it to us is that you can make the atom you know, oscillating between two levels. This oscillation is like a pendulum. And this oscillation is like to have a clock. We call this atomic clock. It's the most precise way to define second. It's the most precise measurement of time, is the oscillation between two uh, energy levels of an atom. Then uh, first, uh, the, the second was defined in terms of cesium. Now there is a new the redefinition of second going on. But the key point is that this precision of atomic clock uh, is essential to make the GPS in your mobile phone to work. Because the GPS knows, uh, needs to know the space and the time. And for the time, you need a clock, which is an atomic clock. Another example, which I also like to give, is that now you have these two energy levels, but the distance between these two levels is not fixed. Actually, if you have a magnetic field around, even a very small magnetic field, this uh, distance of the energy can change. It's an energy difference. So if you have a magnetic field around you and you measure this energy difference between A1 and A2, you can immediately measure the magnetic field. Why it's relevant? Well, it's relevant in many applications. Even, let's say, thinking about the brain. So when a neuron is activated, it's creating a tiny magnetic field. And actually, those, uh, an atom, or something similar to an atom, can be a sensor for the magnetic field or for the, let's say, anomalies in the magnetic field distribution of your brain. Because it's a sensor with an exquisite uh, capacity to measure very tiny magnetic field. In my lab, uh, if I look at my atom, I can tell you where the elevator of the building is. Because an elevator, when it moves, creates magnetic field. And my atoms are sensors. That's not a very nice effect. We need to compensate. But just to give the sense that one atom can really measure very small magnetic field. And what happens if you don't have one? but you have many atoms, many, many more atoms, and each atom are, you know, interacting between each other. Here you enter from, let's say, the single quantum object to what it's called the many-body quantum physics, which is actually my, uh, my field of research. And the first things that you need to think about uh, is that uh, for uh, our field of research, uh, there is uh, something that we don't like. And what we don't like is temperature. Because for us, if the atoms are hot and they move, this is really a noise that it's masking all the quantum phenomena. So the first thing we need to do is to cool down enormously the temperature and go to very, very close to zero uh, temperature. Now, cooling down doesn't mean to stop the motion of an atom. 
but it means that to make a strange transition into what it's called the, the wave particle duality. When we decrease temperature, if each of these atoms start to behave as a wave. And this is another craziness of quantum physics. The atoms start to have the probability like a wave, that's really matter, object that has a weight, and start to be delocalized as a wave. There is a probability to find atom in very various uh, places of the space. And the smaller is the temperature, longer is the wave. Up to some point uh, in which all this wave uh, made of matter will interfere and create uh, what it's called the Bose-Einstein condensate, which is a gigantic wave, uh, all following uh, macroscopically the law of quantum mechanics, uh, which uh, actually have been uh, discovered already about 20 years ago. But now you might ask me, OK, how cold we should be? actually. And uh, we need to be pretty cold. Uh, and now to give you a sense, uh, those two points on this uh, temperature scale, that's like our thermometer, the coldest place in the Earth and the hottest place in the Earth, in my scale, are almost the same point. Okay? Then uh, the temperature is just of the sun's surface is just a bit far away. And uh, if you think about the coldest space in the, in the universe, this background cosmic radiation is also here nearby. And here is the very intense collision between particles. And we are here with ultra cold atom. And now let me show you how it is. So you have, this is a video, you have atom going in uh, uh, one direction. And, uh, and then uh, this blue light is what we use to slow down the motion. We use light uh, and what is called laser cooling to slow down the motion of our atom. And all the atoms are now getting, uh, you know, in some region here captured. And here is where the final part of cooling uh, is happening. And we are preparing our gas at this very, very, very low temperature here. OK, that's, of course, a video. And the first time that the Bose-Einstein condensate was observed was in June 95. And uh, this is with a specific atom called rubidium. And you see the appearance uh, of this huge peak, uh, which is indicate that there is this uh, kind of interference uh, of wave. And then it was predicted by Bose and Einstein. And then many, many years later, thanks also to the development of technology, was created. And the type of atom that we have, uh, I mean, that's how the lab look like. That's our lab in Innsbruck. A lot of light, a lot of mirror. And actually, in Innsbruck, what we use is specific atoms which are strongly magnetic. Now, I just want to give you one example of what can be done with this magnetic atom and then close. Actually, we are used to think that matter have a three state. You can have things around you which are solid or liquid or in gas phase. But uh, it's also possible to have new type of state of matter that escape completely this type of classification. It's uh, you know, a little bit, uh, and in our case, uh, it's a gas. I told you a condensate is a gas, which have both properties of being a solid and a liquid. And because of all these special properties, this is called the super solid state. It's a little bit like the Schrodinger cat, that it's alive and dead. But here we have a state that is super uh, simultaneously fluid and crystal. And actually, it was not very clear that this state was uh, existing. There are very prominent scientists uh, very convinced that it was impossible to, have a, to create a state which is both solid and liquid at the same time. And the others uh, that said, no, it's possible. Quantum mechanics uh, allow this type of state. And Dolo of four got the Nobel Prize. So it was a very high level discussion between them. And at the end, I mean, uh, there were several thoughts on how to prove, realize this type of state. And, uh, and a few years ago, my group and the group uh, in Italy and another one in, uh, in Germany realized with the gas, uh, the first state, uh, which is super solid, each, you see, there is a gas but all atoms, you know, are independently organizing in a very, you know, order phase while keeping 
global phase coherence and you can really you know cool down the system and get this new type of state and even go let's say to two dimension and this is just an example of what we can do if we have many many particles and to give you a flavor of how many discovery there will be and i would like to conclude now my talk with, uh, you know, again, a sentence. We started with the sentence, let's close with the sentence, which said, the scientific person does not aim at an immediate result. Actually, his or her duty is to lay at the foundation of those who are to come and point the way. I'm sure that the founding father of quantum mechanics never thought that we would go so far with understanding at this new field of research. And with this, I would like also to present my team in Innsbruck and to also say thanks to the fantastic team that, you know, were in this journey with me. Thanks. Oh, okay. So we have time for two questions in case uh, you want to try <laughs> out. Uh, there is a. Uh, yes. First of all, thanks for this uh, amazing talk. I really enjoyed this one through the quantum world. Oh, thank, thank you. you. And, and my question is just out of curiosity in the last part where you show us this video where you cool down the atoms with the laser cooling, then they stop in this orange intersection, what were those orange things? Yes, we do actually, thanks a lot for this nice question. We do everything with light. So on the one hand, the light can be used to stop the motion of the particle, and so that means to cool down the particle um, if they have the right color, okay? And then we can, uh, you know, we have the beam and we stop the beam, but at the same time, the light can be used to simply trap. If, you know, the light has not the right color, you can use this light to create any sort of trap. Like, for example, also to create crystal of light where you would put a single atom in every crystal side. Quantum simulate properties of material, solid state physics, and this type of things. Thank okay. you. Thanks. I don't know if there is another question. Yeah. <laughs> Could you give us some hint of what's the difference between a superfluid and this super solid phenomenon? Yes. Okay. So the super solid is a state which is superfluid. Okay, so it's a special class, but it's a class in which the atoms that are indistinguishable and compose the system not only have agreed among themselves that they have to be coherent, have only one phase, but they also agree among themselves where to be in space. So they, they kind of break the translational symmetry and create this wave uh, like a crystal, so a periodic structure in space. So they have both, but since they are indistinguishable, you cannot say which particle is actually flowing and which one is localized in the supersolid. And these uh, things that you cannot say that they are simultaneously with both properties make the state, uh, uh, let's say, un uh, uncutable. You cannot cut the solid part and remain with the other. They are highly correlated. Thanks. Okay, so thank you very much for your time. <laughs>